In the end, what many feared ended up happening. Putin sets partial military call-up won't bluff on nukes. The total number of reservists to be called up could be as high as 300 a thousand, officials said. Shortly after Putin's address, Russian media reported a sharp spike in demand for plane tickets abroad. On 21st of September 2022, Russian dictator Vladimir Putin decreed the partial mobilization of troops, which implies the call-up and entry into combat of Russian civilians. In theory, it is a muster of those civilians who have military training and were enrolled in the reserve. At least, that's what they were thinking, because the truth is that the recruitment is turning out to be a disaster and all kinds of people are being called up. But we'll talk about that another time. The fact is that it was only a matter of time before this decision would be taken. The invasion of Ukraine has gone from being a matter of patriotic pride in Mother Russia to becoming the Kremlin's worst nightmare. Intelligence failures, overestimation of its military capabilities, corruption in the military industry, and the perception that Ukraine would dissolve like a sugar cube after the entry of Russian troops has meant that things could not have turned out worse for the Kremlin and for Russia. What else can I say? In past videos here on Visual Politic, we have already told you about many of the reasons for the Russian debacle. But what we have not yet told you about is one of the key factors that has made the invasion a nightmare for Moscow. A reason recognized and denounced by Vladimir Putin himself. I am, of course, referring to Western weapons. Let's get started. With the speed at which the war in Ukraine is evolving, some of you may not even remember these images anymore. However, during the early days of the criminal Russian invasion, the truth is that few people were as optimistic about Ukraine's future as they are now, seven months later. Remember when some said that Kyiv was going to fall in less than a week? Well, exactly. In late February, in a matter of a few hours, a huge number of Russian helicopters, tanks, soldiers, missiles, ships, and fighter bombers rushed at full speed over Ukraine from the north, south, and east. At that time, Ukraine seemed to have only an old-fashioned Soviet-era army and a few Western weapons. So it's understandable that virtually no one was betting anything on the country's resistance. Since then, however, things have changed so much that as the summer progressed, Ukraine seized the initiative. Six months after the invasion began, the Russians were already on the ropes. Visual Politic community, those of you who have been following us for a long time may remember this video that we published before the invasion took place. In it, we told you how Ukraine could end up becoming a fatal trap for Russia, and that is exactly what has happened. In addition to the fierce and tenacious resistance of the Ukrainians, Moscow's miscalculations also failed to take into account another key factor, that Western weapons would flood into Ukraine. So far, most of the equipment delivered to Ukraine from the West has not even been highly sophisticated or even lethal. And when it has been, as we shall see, it has been in small quantities. However, despite this, the weapons given to the Ukrainians by the Allies have demonstrated such a superiority over the Russian equipment that they have completely transformed the war situation. The technological superiority superiority is simply vast, much greater than anyone could have imagined. And so in this video, we are going to tell you precisely how Western weapons have made it possible to curb Vladimir Putin's neo-imperialist aspirations. And we're going to do it with real examples, taking as a reference the weapons that are being most decisive in this war. We will tell you exactly what role and function each of them has had in each phase of this terrible war. So without much further ado, let's get into it. Iron Rain. If there is one thing in which Russia far surpasses not only Ukraine, but virtually any country in the world, it is in the amount of ground military equipment. We are talking about armored vehicles, tanks, and above all, artillery equipment. Of course, we're talking about quantity, not so much about quality and precision, which is another story. And the military doctrine, with some modifications, basically remains that of the Soviet era. This consisted of squeezing their huge amount of artillery to create an intense iron rain that would clear the area and open the way for tanks and armored vehicles, something like a saturation war. And in fact, after the failure of the initial invasion, this has been exactly the strategy followed by Russia in the Donbass region. But even during the initial phase of the war, the spirit was in some ways not very different, but with a very important nuance. Convinced of its enormous superiority, Moscow 
wanted the operations to be lightning fast. For this purpose, they mobilized a huge amount of heavy equipment to literally overwhelm the Ukrainian army and reach its targets at full speed. In this case, the role of artillery was replaced by precision missiles launched by the Air Force and Naval Force. The problem, the weak point of this form of warfare, is that by mobilizing so much military equipment, gigantic quantities of supplies are also needed. And I think you will know, this has been, and probably still is, their biggest weakness. We can suspect that Russians did not properly organize the logistics necessary for an effective Plan B. Trucking takes a lot of time, and the tyranny of distance becomes really, really challenging because they're trying to push a large force down some fairly narrow roads. Michael Kaufman, Director of Russia Studies at CNA Research and Analysis Organization. But apart from the issue of supplies, which has been and will continue to be key in this war, another of the major problems has been precisely in the Russian weaponry itself, in the strategy for its use and its real operational combat capabilities. So before before getting into the details of the role played by Western weapons, we need to know exactly what a typical Russian attack battalion is composed of and how it is organized. Well, Ukrainian forces have noted that the Russians deploy their artillery with a separation from the front line of one third of its maximum range for safety. And so mortars make up the first line of artillery and are placed one and a half kilometers from the Russian troops at the front. Behind them, about eight kilometers, that's roughly five miles away, the short and medium range tactical artillery teams are placed. And in another line somewhat farther away, between 10 and 15 kilometers or six to nine miles away, the deep fire artillery is placed, which is the one that attacks the enemy rear. Also, the most powerful Russian artillery is used as an area denial weapon. That is to prevent the enemy from crossing, or if necessary, to force them to retreat to a certain frontline area. The idea with this strategy is to create a kind of iron rain that cleans the area so that later the infantry can advance to take positions with tanks and armored personnel carriers. In this way, Russian attacks are designed to achieve solid gains through the use of enormous firepower. And this is, for example, what explains why we are seeing so many cities and towns completely razed to the ground. The Russians do not discriminate. It is the worst expression of war in all its rawness. In other words, the Russian army needs its artillery to be fully operational. And as we've seen, airstrikes are not an effective alternative to this scheme. Precisely for this reason, the main players are the MLRS, or multiple launch rocket systems, such as the Grad, supported by the Uragan and the Tornado, all of them of Soviet technology or adaptations of it. Grads are non-precision MLRS systems that have been in production since 1964. And although they have undergone upgrades over time, they remain, in essence, a basically analog and rudimentary weapon. They are capable of launching 40 122 mm high explosive rockets in less than 20 seconds over an area of about 100 meters wide. In other words, they provoke a real rocket storm, rockets that hit anything at random, regardless of whether they are military or civilian targets. Well, the fact is that a typical Russian battalion could launched more than 700 rockets with this weapon in less than half a minute. In fact, up until the beginning of summer, Russia was launching some 20,000 artillery shells every day. Let's just say that knowing that they are extremely inaccurate weapons, the Russians tried to compensate for the lack of accuracy with a huge amount of fire. The problem is that this further compounds the problem that we have already seen. Huge and constant supplies of ammunition are needed to keep the Russian lines active. Not to mention that in the end, it means firing blindly, regardless of whether the shells end up hitting civilian areas. In other words, committing war crimes. War crimes have been committed in Ukraine. The commission observed firsthand the damage that explosive weapons had caused to residential buildings and infrastructure, including schools and hospitals. In short, for Russia, to be able not only to advance, but also to hold the occupied terrain, its rear guard must be very well protected, because that is where the ammunition depots that feed its entire strategy are located. And guess what? Right there is precisely where Western weaponry comes into play. Listen up. From St. Javelin to St. Hymars. 
Do you remember this meme? It's Saint Javelin, an image that went viral during the first stage of the war. T-shirts, flags, and all kinds of merchandising were made displaying it. And it's no wonder. The more than 8,500 Javelin delivered wreaked havoc on Russian tanks and armoured vehicles in the first phase of the invasion. Of course, they were not the only key weapons. Other anti-tank missiles, such as the Swedish-British N-Law, or the Stinger anti-aircraft missiles, of which more than 2,000 units have been delivered, also played a key role. Not to mention the Turkish Bayraktar drones. Of course, the choice of this equipment was not accidental. Intelligence information, the war in Georgia, and the very makeup of the Russian army made it a priority for the Allies. The idea was, deliver to Ukraine weapons that, first, would facilitate a kind of asymmetric warfare against the invasion of armoured vehicles and tanks. Second, would deny airspace. And third, that would make it possible to destroy the supply chains in the Russian rear guard. Well, that was exactly the job of anti-tank, man-portable anti-aircraft missiles, and drones, respectively. Keep in mind that the Rapid Russian incursion exposed their armoured units in kilometre-long lines with hardly any protection. And guess what? The strategy was a success, and a terrible surprise for the Russians. Suddenly, their enormous military superiority and rapid raids turned into a race of endless losses. Armoured vehicles and helicopters faced terrible attrition, while at the same time, supply lines disappeared, leaving the entire military operation adrift. To make matters worse, the lack of supplies, such as fuel, made the armoured units even more exposed. Come on, it was an epic disaster. Since then, however, time has passed, and Ukraine has consolidated its front, and the Russians have been worn down. The type of warfare has also changed. And this has also meant a change in the type of arms delivered from the Allies, and in particular from the United States. To give you an idea, by the end of August, the Americans alone had provided Ukraine with some $15.5 billion in security assistance. And if we add to this the armaments sent by other Allied countries, the figure practically doubles. You could say that little by little, the Allies, and especially the United States, the United Kingdom, and Poland have upped the ante with this type of weapons that they send to Ukraine. But the thing is, as we've already mentioned, after the initial disaster, the Russians went back to Soviet military doctrine, and Ukraine simply and plainly had no capability to counter the Russian artillery. Basically, what they could do was to try to resist. That explains why the month of May was particularly hard for the Ukrainians, who added hundreds of casualties every day. However, as of June, new equipment began to arrive to counteract this situation. Unlike Russian weaponry that is designed to provide great firepower, Western weaponry is designed with one premise, an obsession with precision. This requires more sophisticated equipment and weaponry, but also reconnaissance capabilities on targets. In the case of Ukraine, reconnaissance is achieved in three different ways. Firstly, with the intensive use of drones that try to fly as close as possible to Russian lines. Many of them are evidently shot down. And in fact, the average life of the drones used by Ukraine is barely seven days, but they still serve their purpose. The second way is the collaboration of the local population and the use of special forces. Logically, here the Ukrainians have an advantage. After all, they are playing on home ground. And the third way is the information provided by their allies. Don't forget that the United States has the capacity to monitor Russian forces at all times, and have no doubt that the Pentagon satellites are aimed at the situation in Ukraine. Well, in this way, the Ukrainians managed to locate the targets, fix the coordinates, and attack with precision artillery, which began to arrive particularly from the month of June. It was then that another of the great protagonists of this war made its grand entrance. Surely you have all heard of the HIMARS. <laughs> The HIMARS, or High Mobility Artillery Rocket System, is a high-precision system capable of launching artillery fire with a margin of error of less than 7 meters, or roughly 20 feet. In other words, they practically always hit the target. This implies an enormous strategic advantage, especially when compared to the 100 meter, or 328 foot accuracy of the Grad, or the very low accuracy of the most advanced Russian long-range artillery, such as the Tornado S, or the Smirch. In addition, to operate the 16 HIMARS delivered to Ukraine up until September. Yes, that's right, only 16 so far. The US has been delivering M30 and M31 guided rocket ammunition with ranges between 15 and 92 kilometers. That's 9 to 57 miles. These rockets fly so fast that they can reach a target 80 kilometers away in less than two minutes. So in short, that means that the Russians have no time to escape once they have been detected. 
And not only that, the truth is that if the US wanted to, there is still room to give Ukraine even more of an artillery edge. Not only by delivering more HIMARS, but also the Army Tactical Missile System. These are surface-to-surface -surface missiles that Ukraine has been asking for for a long time, and that have a range of 300 kilometers, a whopping 186 miles. Do you understand what it means to attack with precision at a distance of 300 kilometers? Crazy! Of course, Washington is reluctant to give them to Ukraine at the moment because they could be used to attack Russia, which would escalate the war even further. One of the problems that the United States has when sending more advanced weaponry to Ukraine is that, once delivered, it loses control over much of it. This means that almost everything is at stake in trusting the Ukrainian authorities. Be that as it may, the fact is that, even without these advanced missiles, with just the rockets already in operation, the Ukrainians can hit almost any target in the Russian military rear with devilish accuracy. Command centers, fuel depots, supply depots, communications equipment, and even the Russian artillery itself. In this way, the Ukrainians are inflicting a massive damage to the Russian troops. And given the longer range of the HIMARS, the Russians cannot defend themselves. So far, they have tried with the Tochka-U missiles, missiles that have more range, but are nevertheless easy targets to intercept and very slow to operate. So their results have been dismal. To top it off, these HIMAR launchers are quite fast and agile at changing locations. So basically, by the time the Russians try to attack their position, they've already vanished. That is why, in practice, the Russians are only trying to use electronic warfare systems and GPS jammers. With these systems, they are trying to disorientate the HIMARS guided rockets. The problem? That the use of this equipment requires a huge amount of fuel. And remember what the Ukrainians are doing with fuel and supply stores? Well, that's just it. The result is that the Russians have only been able to use them intermittently. And the question that I'm sure many of you are asking is, so what effect has the entry into combat of one of the star pieces of US artillery really had? Because of its long range and high accuracy, in addition to the damage suffered, Russia has had to move its ammunition depots and other supplies away from the front line, which naturally greatly complicates all operations. Ukraine claims it can hit most Russian supply lines in the south. So all in all, after the entry into combat of the HIMARS, the Russian troops are much worse supplied, have suffered considerable damage damage and have also had to abandon occupied territories that they simply could no longer hold. You want an example? Well, take the more than 6,000 square kilometers, that's 3,700 square miles recovered by Ukraine in Kharkiv Oblast and in the south. And not only that, it's also what explains news like this. Russians outnumbered 8 to 1 in counterattack. And all of this thanks to only 16 HIMARS out of more than 400 in the US arsenal. Imagine what could happen if Washington decides to, I don't know, double that number. Crazy. The fact is that this weapon has been so successful that it seems that it will be key in the coming years in the defense, not only of Eastern Europe, but also of other countries throughout the world. Take a look. We are increasing the capabilities of our rocket and artillery forces. I have signed an LOR related to the acquisition of about 500 M142 HIMARS launchers for more than 80 batteries of the HOMAR system. Mariusz Blazicek, Defense Minister of Poland. HIMARS rockets have been a game changer in Ukraine, and the US Army is now looking for ways to build up to 500 more. Next to Ukraine, perhaps the most notable buyer would be Taiwan, which now plans to order 29 HIMARS. Well, as we've told you, this weapon has been a turning point for the Ukrainian army, but it was not the only one. We cannot forget how important the role of the Javelin was in the first phase of the war, or that of anti-aircraft systems, such as the S-300s, donated by allies from the former communist bloc, or the role of the NASAMs will have, of which the United States have committed around 80 units that will soon be delivered. Systems that, in short, will keep preventing the Russians from having control of Ukrainian airspace, something that they haven't achieved after seven months of war. And wait a minute, because we can't end this video without mentioning the AGM-88 high-speed anti-radiation missiles. These highly advanced missiles allow the Ukrainians to temporarily disable enemy radars in order to attack more safely. That is part of the reason why we are seeing numerous Ukrainian Air Force operations again. In order to use these missiles, by the way, Ukrainian Sukhoi 27s and MiG 29s from the Soviet era had to be adapted for more than two months. And to do that in the middle of a war is highly commendable. And we can't forget about the 126 American M777 howitzers sent to Ukraine until early September. These howitzers are 
are short-range artillery for the Ukrainian frontline units that are able to hit the Russian front lines with an accuracy of only 5 meters or 16 feet. A real nightmare. In short, we could go on forever telling you about the enormous, the colossal, the gigantic importance of each and every one of the Western weapons donated to Ukraine, particularly the American ones. In this video, we have tried to focus on the most significant ones so that you can discover, above all, how what sometimes appears to be nothing more than simple figures actually hide a strategic design behind the chaos the Russians are facing. But now, at this point, it's your turn. Do you think the West, and especially the European Union, should make a greater effort to give Ukraine more advanced weapons? Leave us your opinion below in the comments. And if you like this video, don't forget to like it, subscribe to our channel, and why not join our community on Patreon to help us continue creating more and better content. Once again, thank you so much for being there. All the best. I'll see you in the next one.